This is 5 on 20 News with Nick Marquez and Saira Livier. It's Tuesday, May 2nd, and we're waiting for eternal nothingness to swallow us up at the Creative Tucson studio in downtown Tucson. First, let's talk local headlines. Officials in Maricopa County on Monday confirmed the first positive case of West Nile virus in Arizona this year. Stephen Good, director of Maricopa County's Environmental Services, says that they found mosquitoes with the disease through routine year-round surveillance of collecting and testing mosquitoes. The infected mosquito was found in the East Valley, but a specific location was not provided. The Control Division of Environmental Services said to avoid standing water, where mosquitoes tend to congregate. They also advise wearing long clothes to avoid mosquito bites. West Nile is a mosquito bred virus that causes severe illness in about 20% of the population and tends to affect those that are 50 years and older. Some of the symptoms include meningitis, encephalitis, paralysis, and even death. If you spot abnormal mosquito activity, report this to the Maricopa County Environmental Services Complaint Hotline at 602-502-0700. Maricopa officials advise to call immediately if you see a group of mosquitoes gathering in a corner, wearing hoodies, or speaking in a foreign language. Arizona agencies are withholding public information according to the Arizona Sonora News. The publication sent 19 requests to different agencies in the state requesting records that are supposed to be open to the public. Of these 19 agencies, only nine responded, with three responding on the same day. The Arizona Attorney General's Office was the only agency that provided all the information it was asked for. Meanwhile, the State Senate was the only agency that ignored the request without even sending a confirmation email. Agencies are able to duck the request because the law states that they must respond in a timely manner, but no definition is given for what a timely manner means. About half of the agencies responded with a confirmation but didn't turn over records. These include the Governor's Office, the Arizona Board of Regents, the Arizona Department of Child Safety, and the Arizona Secretary of State. When asked about the lapse in responding, Governor Ducey's office said that the governor's still trying to figure out this whole email thing. A group of Arizona school districts have sued the state for insufficient funding for building maintenance and repair. The lawsuit claims that the legislature has shorted them billions of dollars that are mandated by the state's constitution over the past decade. The Arizona Supreme Court ruled in 1994 that it is the state's responsibility to provide funding for major maintenance and textbooks. But the legislature began cutting funding after the recession of 2008 and never reinstated the former funding levels as the economy has improved. School systems in Arizona say the state owes them about $2 billion in funding. The lawsuit was filed from a Glendale Elementary School that was shut down because of emergency repairs last year. This served as a symbol of the dilapidated state of some schools in Arizona. Governor Doug Ducey didn't comment on the lawsuit, but repeated his robotic pledge that he is prioritizing education in this year's budget. Ducey is proposing $114 million in additional K-12 funding this year which would start on July 1st. Schools officials says that they need about $300 million per year in special funding just for building maintenance. They also criticized Ducey's education plan because he expanded vouchers for private charter schools. Critics say that, they, that this will push more people toward private schools rather than relying on the state's K-12 system. Ducey said that Arizona is full of sunshine, so it won't matter if a school's roof falls apart because the kids will get lots of vitamin D, which is important for learning. Arizona Salt, Salt River Project is being accused of not providing transparent online records, according to Government Watchdog. The report studied special districts, which are independent from state and local jurisdictions, and found that more than half got failing grades for transparency. The U.S. Public Interest Research Group report said that the SRP neglected to include checkbook level spending in its online reports. Michelle Surka, one of the report's authors, said that the autonomy of special districts has led them to fall off the map in terms of spending transparency. Representatives from the SRP said the district is not subject to the government accounting 
Standards Board and therefore do not issue a comprehensive annual financial report. This type of report would include the checkbook level spending and the report said the SRP lacked. The SRP is one of 326 special districts in Arizona, but the only one covered in the report, which looked at the 79 highest spending special districts nationwide. Special districts can include anything from fire protection districts to port authorities and can sometimes straddle to different states. The practice has invoked criticism by those who say the special districts are able to skirt standard financial disclosures. But the districts maintain that they are special and their critics are just hating on their specialness. Next time you see that lumpy orange fumbling through a speech, you can partially thank Arizona. The state gave $1.5 million towards the president's record-breaking inauguration fund a huge increase from the 26000 that Arizona gave Obama's inauguration in 2012, according to Federal Election Commission reports. But most of the money came from GoDaddy founder Bob Parsons, who gave $1 million. Other donors to the fund included 25000 from the Apollo Education Group, who owns the University of Phoenix, and 250000 from General Motors of Arizona. The other 12 donors from Arizona didn't seem to realize that they were donating to the fund such as Iona Morphosis, who says she bought five inaugural plates at $50 each. She said that she was surprised to see her name on the inaugural funding list because she just wanted some plates that would ruin the appetites of her dinner party guests. Critics such as Daniel Weiner said that Trump raised so much money because he forewent the voluntary limits that other presidents placed on the inaugural fund. Trump raised about $107 million for his inauguration, which was, according to Trump, the most popular event of all time, beating out Woodstock, the storming of Normandy, and the birth of Jesus. And I wanted to take a moment to talk about the program you're watching right now. Here at 5 on 20 News, we are undertaking a new kind of citizen journalism. We are going to give you the news as we see it. And we want more people to speak up with us. We need writers, hosts, anchors, camera people, sound people, the whole gamut. The times require a new way of informing ourselves, so join us. Do it. Do it now. Email us at info at creativetucson.org to get involved. And if you think there's a story we're missing, a person we should interview, an upcoming event we should cover, and have any news tips for us, shoot an email to info at creativetucson.org. We are here for you, and we want to cover all stories from all points of views, so don't be strangers. Now in national and international news. The White House is sending conflicted messages regarding the cancellation of education programs started by former First Lady Michelle Obama. On Monday morning, CNN reported that an internal White House memo stated that they would be discontinuing the Let Girls Learn program, which helps girls in developing countries seek educational opportunities. The memo said that the Peace Corps would no longer let the, use the Let Girls Learn brand name and wouldn't be using it as a standalone program. Let Girls Learn was administered by the Peace Corps in 44 countries. Last year, the program announced more than 5 million in new private sector commitment, commitments to help address boundaries facing adolescent girls from getting an education. But the White House insists that the Let Girls Learn program will still technically continue, just that they won't be using the name and won't be using the funds for the same reason. Let Girls Learn will now be called the Junior Border Patrol. In a separate statement, Trump's Secretary of Agriculture announced that the agency is scrapping certain health standards for school lunches set by Mich Michelle Obama's Healthy Eating Initiative. The standards concerned sodium levels, milk fat content, and the inclusion of whole grains. Purdue said that the program was not effective because kids would not eat the healthier food. When pressed further, Purdue admitted that he just really loves Sloppy Joes. An opponent of contraception is taking charge of the agency in charge of family planning, according to Politico. Teresa Manning was appointed Deputy Assistant Secretary for Population Affairs at the Department of Health and Human Services, causing opponents to call for her withdrawal. Her position would put her in charge of Title X funding,
the quarter of a billion dollar program that provides contraceptive services to low income and uninsured men and women. The agency also aids the federal government in preventing teen pregnancy and establishing guidelines for family planning. Manning is an adjunct law professor at George Mason University and has worked for the National Right to Life Committee and the Family Research Council, both extreme opponents of abortion and LGBTQ rights. Don Leggins, uh, Planned Parenthood's executive vice president, said that Manning's appointment is, quote, unacceptable. She said that her appointment is equivalent to the fox guarding the hen house and that low-income women would pay the price. In the past, Manning has said, quote, contraception doesn't work and that family planning is something that occurs between a husband and a wife and God and doesn't really involve the federal government. When asked about her comment, God said to leave him out of it. A Utah Republican has introduced legislation that would nullify the Federal Communication Commission's net neutrality rules on Monday. Senator Mike Lee wrote the legislation, which gathered co-sponsors by a smattering of Republicans, including Ted Cruz, Tom Cotton, and J James Inhofe. The bill would issue a full repeal of net neutrality, which protects the internet from being controlled by cable providers like Comcast and Verizon. FCC Chairman Ajit Pai introduced his own plan last week to curb certain areas of net neutrality, with the plan to be voted on in May. Pai's plan wouldn't get rid of net neutrality, but rather transfer the regulatory jurisdiction to the FTD instead of the FCC. But Lee's bill goes even further by completing gutting net, completely gutting net neutrality. He says that the rule is standing in the way of internet innovation by placing federal bureaucrats in charge of engineering the internet's future. Rather, Lee thinks that a gigantic corporation with no interest in the people will be more appropriate. The bill is likely to see intense opposition among Democrats, who generally support net neutrality. Opponents of Lee's bill say that this will enable cable companies to pick and choose winners of the internet. An example of an example frequently mentioned is that a cable company could slow the connection for streaming on services such as Netflix in order to send more customers towards the cable company's streaming services. Democrats, including Ed Markey and Richard Blumenthal, have already said that Republicans are too far to the right on net neutrality and that it's impossible to develop a compromise. In response, we offered a compromise where he gets to kill net neutrality and the Democrats get to complain about it on CNN. Venezuelan President Nicolas Maduro is calling for a new legislative assembly that would allow him to rewrite the Constitution and expand his powers. The new legislative body will be made up of ordinary citizens It would not be able to avoid and would be able to avoid the opposition-controlled National Assembly. Maduro's opponent, Enrique Capriles, said that the new assembly would violate the country's constitution. Protesters have been rage raging for the past month in opposition to Maduro, who protesters say is ignoring the country's need while attempting to strengthen his power. So far, 28 people have been killed by the security forces as part of the protest. Venezuela is suffering from food and medicine shortages and hyperinflation in the, th in the thousands of percent. This is causing massively inflated prices for food staples such as vegetables and rice. Maduro has claimed that he is the victim of a conspiracy by Western forces such as the U.S who wants to see his socialist government fail. He says that the new assembly would defuse the country's political crisis by blocking his opponents who are threaten, threatening the country. Maduro said that the assembly would be made up of pro-government workers and representatives of civic society groups. At a May Day rally in Caracas, Maduro said that he does not want a civil war. Meanwhile, protests continued on May Day, with security forces firing tear gas at young men 
who were throwing stones and a small bombs at the police. Maduro responded to the rioters by asking how they were able to afford all of those bombs. A new report by government watchdog found that security incidents and civilian casualties are at record highs in Afghanistan. The report by the Special Inspector General for Afghanistan Reconstruction, or SIGAR, was released at the same time that the Trump administration is weighing the decision to send more troops to the country to fight ISIS and the Taliban. SIGAR's report found that a total of $117 billion has been spent for Afghanistan reconstruction efforts, with 60% going to the Afghan National Defense and Security Force. Despite the huge price tag, a top U.S. commander says that the battle against the Taliban is at a stalemate. The report found that con conflict-related civilian casualties reached their highest levels since the U.N. began document documenting, documenting them in 2009, which al with almost 3,500 civilians killed and close to 8,000 injured. The figure does not include last week's Taliban attack at a military base that killed at least 100 Afghan soldiers. The inspector's report states that Afghan security forces face unsustainable casualties, temporary loss of city centers, weakness in logistics, illiteracy in the ranks, and corrupt leadership. In other words, the war is a huge success. It also mentions over on an over-reliance on special forces for routine missions, which is perceived as a waste of resources. About 35% of Afghan security forces do not re-enlist each year, and close to 1,400 soldiers were fired for corruption last year. According to the report, another problem facing Afghan forces is the high level of opium production by the Taliban, who were able to fund their forces through sales of the drug. Currently, opium accounts for about 60% of the Taliban's funding and stands near record levels. This is occurring at the same time that an opioid epidemic is devastating the U.S., which further empowers the Taliban. Libertarian groups say that the Taliban's opium business is perfect example of the free market in action and say that the U.S. could learn a thing or two. A Dallas area teenager was shot dead by police late Saturday night as he drove away from a party. Witnesses report that Jordan Edwards, a high school freshman, was killed when officers fired through the passenger side window. Balch Springs Police Chief Jonathan Haver initi initially apologized to Edwards' family, but said that the vehicle was backing toward an officer in, in quote, an aggressive manner. But by Monday afternoon, Haver retracted his statement Admitted, admitting that the car was moving forward, not backward, and that there was no altercation between the five teenagers in the car and the police. Regardless, Haver said that one of the officers fire, fired a rifle multiple times into the passenger's window, despite none of the teenagers carrying weapons. Haber said that this review of the officer's body camera revealed that the shooting, quote, may not meet the department standards. The officer, who is still unnamed, was placed on administrative leave and both the Dallas County Sheriff's Department and the Dallas County D District's Attorney's Office are conducting investigations. Lee Merritt, the attorney for Edwards' family, said that the teenager's parents will continue to push for the officer's arrest. Merritt said that they are, quote, declaring war on bad policing because this has happened far too often. But Dallas officials say that Merritt has no authority to declare war, war and that they would seek impeachment proceedings. This was Saira Livier. And Nick Marquez for 5 on 20 News, where the crew try to get you to say weird things, but it won't work. <laughs> Have a nice e evening, and we'll see you tomorrow. <laughs> I can't read that. Well, I like no. I totally get it and I understand it. It's just so hard for me. Like I mess up. I was trying my best. It's just I, I make reading error errors more when I when it's slow. slow.
Because, like, no, like I said, I totally get the reasoning and I don't blame you for it. 